remarkable to see how the Lord raised up David, and, and David had such a heart that was so fixed and focused upon the Lord. Nothing deterred David. Though David wasn't a perfect man, he had failures, he had his weaknesses, but David truly was a man after God's own heart. And, you know, in kind of teaching the study there, I've, I've, you know, I've done it before, but, but just this time kind of looking at this and reading through the Psalms, it, it, it brought for me a, a sense of awareness that, you know, the Lord is faithful and his desire is to work through our lives. Oftentimes, the idea of the Christian faith is, you know, that we're Christians and that God will go and fight our battles and, and there's victory after victory. And all those things are true in a sense in the scriptures. But the point is, is that God wants to take your life where you are, right where you're at, and he wants to have these victories through you, in and through you. In other words, yes, the Lord goes before us and he fights for us, but God brings you along in that battle. He, he brings you with him. And then he, he works in and through you as you get the victory in this battle. As you yield and you surrender and you submit yourself to the Lord, God is faithful to do so. This is the idea that David has here in this psalm. And and it's, it's, it's rather remarkable because you guys know that David's battle with Goliath wasn't his first battle. David had fought, I, I mean, if you were to ask somebody, would you rather face a giant or a lion? I think they would say a giant. Uh, nobody wants to face a lion. Would you rather face a giant or a bear? You would probably say, I would, I'll take the giant. I'll take his knees out. You know what I mean? It's like, I'll, I'll do something, you know. But when you're dealing with a lion and a bear, it's like that's a wild animal. You know, they're known for ripping their prey apart, right? And David is telling Saul, he says, you know what? He says, this uncircumcised Philistine who defies the living God, he says, you don't know, God gave me the power to overcome a lion and a bear. I'll do the same to Goliath. I'll do the same to him. This is the psalmist here in Psalm 108. And the backdrop is not the story of David and Goliath, but, but the backdrop is a couple of psalms that David wrote. The first psalm that David wrote that's the backdrop in a Psalm 108 is Psalm 57. Jot that down, Psalm 57, verses 1 through 11. And you'll find within that psalm, Psalm 57, verses 1 through 11, the verses of 1 through 5 in Psalm 108. So just within these first five verses, you see a psalm of David, Psalm 57, verses 1 through 11, that David will be quoting from pretty much verbatim, for that matter. And then the other psalm is Psalm 60, verses 5 through 12, Psalm 60, verses 5 through 12, which picks up the rest of this psalm in verses 6 through 13. So what we have here is two divisions, really, in the psalm. The first division is one of David's earlier psalms written, and that is Psalm 57, verses 1 through 11. The second portion of this psalm, verses 6 through 13, is another psalm that David wrote, which is Psalm 60, verses 5 through 12. So what do you have here? You have Psalm 108 is comprised of two psalms that David had already wrote. Why is David repeating himself? Think about this. You could literally go back to Psalm 57 and study the first five verses of this chapter and you wouldn't even need to come and read Psalm 108. And you could literally go to Psalm chapter 60, verses 5 through 12, and study those verses and you won't even have to come to Psalm 108 and read verses 6 through 13. Why is it that David takes the time to take two psalms and compile them together and make them one? Well, the Bible says here that the psalm, that it's entitled, The Assurance of God's Victory Over Enemies. You know, one of the things we always say to people is this, whenever you're facing a trial or adversity or difficulty in your life, and no matter how difficult that situation or circumstance might be, and no matter how far the victory might be in sight, always remember God's past victories in your life. You see, God's track record is perfect. It's perfect. It's a perfect track record. God's never lost a battle. He's never lost. He's always won. 
And the point that's being made here is that we can rest in God's past victories, but not only looking at the victories that God has, but how about the victories in our life? We go through the victories in Scripture and we read uh, these stories of these great men and women of God and the people of God as God would give them victory in when all the odds were stacked against them. And we're so encouraged by it. But what about when the odds were stacked against us? Or perhaps when we had a difficulty, uh, an ailment, a disease, a circumstance, heartache, heartbreak, loss of resources, whatever the case might be, tragedy or pain. And you want to know what? Or it could just be being distant from the Lord. That's, that within itself causes a lot of sorrow when you're distant from God. And, 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 you know, it's interesting because a lot of these things kind of flood your mind, you know, when you, when you go on a trip to Israel. You start to think and you start to really realize, man, Lord, this is the place. Like, this is where it all went down. I mean, it's all here. But then you begin to realize the people are so far removed. And then you begin to think of your own personal life. And you realize how far removed you are also from the Lord. Because just as much as His presence and his tangible uh, presence was in Israel, it's here also. The Lord is everywhere. The Bible says that he is omnipresent. He's everywhere present at one time. And, and so when we were on the Sea of Galilee, one of the nights we were having a time of, uh, of, of afterglow, and, and it, was, it was the night that, that we had just got to the Galilee, and, and our stop before there was a place called Joppa, and remember that that's where the Lord had revealed to Peter that God was going to do a new thing. He was going to do a new thing. God was going to work in the lives of the Gentile people. Remember that? And God gave Peter this vision. And as we're there in front of the, the place, it's believed to be the doorstep of, of Simon the Tanner. We're there on his front door. You know, I knocked and he wasn't home, you know. But anyways, so we're there. And, and as I'm saying, it's a little tiny courtyard, very small. And I told them, look up, because the same cloud, this is where Peter was looking up when this vision came down. The same thought and idea I had when I was looking at the moon on the Sea of Galilee. I said, this is the same moon that Jesus looked at when he was here doing his ministry in the Galilee. But it's the same moon that we set our eyes on even tonight as we step outside this church. And the reality is, is that the Lord's just not in Israel. The Lord is here. And the victories are not just in Israel. The victories are also in our lives. And I think this is the idea that David is bringing about. David in no way is saying, hey, you have to go in. You have to be a Jew in order to experience God's presence like this or victory. No, David is encouraging and saying there's an assurance of God's victory over our enemies. The psalm goes on to say that it's a song. What does that mean? It's to be sung. It's a song. It's a song that David sung. A Psalm of David. As a matter of fact, maybe if we could say that this is David's remix of Psalm 57 and Psalm 60. David felt it necessary to make Psalm 108 the remix. But here's what you find. David then gives this address. In verse 1, the Bible says, O oh God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing and give praise even with my Glory. Now, one of the things that I want us to kind of focus in on is a couple of things in verse 1. David's heart, and then David says that it's steadfast. David's heart, and David says that it's steadfast. Now, remember that the Lord said that, that he has already chosen a man after his own heart. God speaking to Samuel in regards to who would take the throne next of the kingdom... And the Bible says this uh, to, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I'm sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. And I like this here because this is where the Lord has chosen this is where the Lord has chosen David to be the king over Israel. But I love what he says to him here. He says, fill your horn with oil and go. 
fill your horn with oil and go anoint this king. And, and remember what he says here. He says to him, he says, in a sense, stop crying over Saul. Stop crying. Get it together. Fill your horn with oil and go and anoint this king, this son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among, among his sons. And so what we see here is that David was chosen by the Lord. David was God's choice for the kingdom of Israel. And so you see here, David, when he says that his heart, that his heart, it wasn't just a matter of David saying, well, you know, I got a good heart and, and I have a big heart. No, David was saying that his heart belonged to the Lord, that it was his, that it was God's, that God knew him and that he knew the Lord. And David's knowledge of the Lord was a result of God's faithfulness and goodness in David's life. Even when David did wrong, the Lord was good to him. The Lord was good in his discipline. The Lord was good in his judgment to him. The Lord was faithful. That's why the Lord was good. But here he says, my heart is steadfast. How can David's heart be steadfast? Very simple. The word steadfast in the original language, kaun, means established and fixed. David's heart was fixed to the point from which he could sing. It was fixed to the point from which he could sing a song that would bring praise to the Lord. His heart was set upon God. It was fixed upon the Lord. His heart clearly looked to God's direction and no other direction. And then David says, as a result of his heart being fixed and steadfast upon the Lord, he says, I will, I will sing and give praise. I mean, in other words, David is saying, it's all I can do. All I can do is sing and give praise. You can always tell by how someone loves God by what comes out of their mouth. You can tell where a person's heart is truly at by what they begin to say. A person can be identified by the very words that come from their mouth because they are words that truly come from the heart. Jesus said it in Matthew 12. He made it very clear. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so he says, I will give praise. And look at what he says here, even with my glory. What glory did David have? How is it that David would say, my glory, when we read passages like God shares his glory with no one? What, what type of glory is David speaking about here? Well, we know that he's not talking about the glory of the Lord and that glory that's attributed to God alone because it's God's glory, not man's glory. But David did have a glory. David did glory in something. Notice what it says here. David says this, I will sing and give praise. Why? Because my heart is steadfast. It's fixed upon the Lord. It says here, even with my glory, with all that I am, with all that is within me. But look at this. He also goes on to say here, with all that I am or all that is within me, even with my glory, awake, lute and harp. Remember that a lute is a 12-stringed instrument. And, and David is saying here, awake lute and harp. This is David's glory. This is what David praises the Lord with. His ability to play was his glory. And he says, God, I'm going to glorify your name with the lute. I will glorify your name with the harp. I will glorify your name with the ability that you've given me to glorify your name with. What abilities has the Lord given you to glorify his name? For some, it's not always playing the guitar, right? We're probably not that good at it. And for some of us, it's probably not singing. Uh, we're probably not that good at it. But it could be other things. It could be things that God has given us, maybe various gifts that we see in the New Testament, gifts of the Holy Spirit that God has given us to bring glory to his name. All that God has given us is so that we can glorify his name. In David's case, it's his ability to play worship. It's his ability to lead God's people. David wasn't just only the king of Israel. David wasn't just only a shepherd. David was also a worshiper of God. David was skilled with the harp. 
David was skilled with the lute. Remember when the distressing spirit came upon Saul, it was David that they called over there to play music and, 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 and then Saul would be relieved of that, of that distressing spirit. And one of the things that we fail to realize is that worship does that. Worship prepares the heart. See, David knew where his heart was because his worship came from his heart. And David could say, I know my heart is fixed upon you. Look at the words that are coming out of my mouth. And David says, I will sing and give praise even with my glory, with all that is within me. And what has God given you to worship and glorify him? What is it that God has said? This is what I want you to use for my honor and for my glory. And you know what? The good thing is that God, when he gives it, he doesn't take it back. He doesn't take it back. The Bible says that the gifts of God, they're irrevocable. And, and you know what? What we do do is we kind of, we put them on a shelf, right? Sometimes we stop exercising these gifts the Lord gives us. And, and, and sometimes we, we, we say things like, well, you know, God knows my heart. Well, that's not, the, that's not the conversation David's trying to have right now. David is saying, because of my heart, because it's fixed upon the Lord, he says, I will sing and I will give praise, even with my glory. With, with, with what you've given me, God, I will give it back to you to bring glory to your name. You know, the world might not understand that. Your friends, people might not really see that at all whatsoever when they say, man, you're still doing the same old thing. It's been years. You better believe it. I, I invite that. I'm not, I'm not bothered by that when people say you're still at it. Man, you haven't given up yet. Giving up is not an option. You just keep pressing on. Just keep moving forward. You know, it's, it, it, this is what God has given me. What, whatever means we have, David says, awake, lute and harp. Some of us need to say that to the very gifts that God has given us. Awake. Speak those words. Speak those words of life into that dead gift or that dead ability. Speak life into it and say, awake, lute and harp. And get back to bringing God glory with the very ability that he's given you to bring glory to his name. And then he goes on to say, I will awaken the dawn. I love that. I will awaken the dawn. David is saying, listen, the first part of the day, I, I mean, the moment my eyes open up, I will glorify your name. Now, glorifying the name of the Lord is not the first thing on anybody's mind when you first wake up in the morning. I mean, it, it just, it's not. And, and uh, you know, you're tired and you're thinking about, oh my goodness, now I got to do this and do that and whatever the case might be. But David is saying, in other words, he's saying, the morning can't come quicker. It cannot come quick enough. I, I just, I want to awaken the day. I want the day to start with praise. I want the day to, to remain in praise. I want it to end in praise. I want it to be a praise-filled day. Day, I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the people. Notice the word for Lord there is all capital letters and it's the covenantal name of God. And he's saying here, I will praise you, the keeper of covenants, the one who is faithful, the one who makes a promise and keeps it. Isn't that so awesome about the Lord? How often have we made promises and we broke them? How often have we prayed certain things to the Lord specifically and said, God, you know, this and God, that and, and Lord, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And, 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 you know, it goes good for a little while, but man, you fall off. I'm so thankful that God is not like us. God doesn't say things to us and then forgets. <laughs> sometimes we forget, sometimes we don't. We just get lazy, I guess. I don't know. But for the most part, the Lord keeps his promises. And I love what he says here. And I think we need to kind of take this idea. So one, focus on this part here, that our hearts are to be fixed. Fixed to a point from which we could sing praise to the Lord. Established. And David says, I will sing and give praise even with my glory. Whatever ability God has given you to glorify his name, get back to it and do it. And don't just do it once. Don't just, don't just say, well, let me see if I have time. No, David in no way is saying that. He says, I will awaken the dawn. 
I'm, I'm going to usher, usher the day in with this. He says, I will praise you, O Lord. Here's, check this out. I will praise you, O Lord, because you're the keeper of covenants. Look at, among the people, and I will sing praises to you among the nations. Among the people and among the nations. In other words, his praise was no secret. His praise was no secret. He wanted everybody to know who he was praising. He wanted everybody to know that his praise and his worship was directed to the Lord among the people and among the nations. People need to know that we're children of God. People need to know that we're Christians. People need to know that we love Jesus. People need to know that all of our abilities, giftings, and talents, our careers, our jobs, our resources, whatever it is that we call blessings in our lives, for some of us it's material things. It might be a vehicle, a home, whatever the case might be, that's between you and the Lord. But the point that's being made is that if that is the case, that all these things are from the Lord and people need to know, God has to get the credit in all of this. He has to. And you give the Lord credit. You say, it's because God is good. It's not, you don't say as the world says, well, you know, it's just, I, I, I'm a hard worker. I, I mean, look at the type of job I got. You know, well, after all, you know, this is, this is what you get when you do my line of work. Well, what about the very breath that you breathe? What school did you have to go to to get that? Who did you have to pay to receive that? Nobody. That's God's grace and gift given to us. So we're to praise him for everything. Think about that. David says his praise would be no secret. I like how he's starting this off because it's this, it's this thrust of, hey, man, if you're not praising God, something's wrong with you. <laughs> it's kind of the picture here. For your mercy, the word mercy, chased in the Hebrew, the word means love. For your love is great above the heavens, above the skies. So he praises him for his love. And then he says here, and your truth. The word here, truth in the Hebrew language, is the Hebrew word ameth. Ameth, which means trust or trustworthiness. And his love and his trustworthiness, his mercy and his truth. He's saying they're vast. Look at what he says here. They are great above the heavens and the truth reaches to the clouds. So he's saying here that his song is of triumph and praise because of God's great love and truth. And then he says in verse 5, be exalted, O God. David's desire was that God would be exalted. What's our desire tonight? Is your desire that God is exalted? Not just that God is exalted because you say that God is exalted by what you say. No, because that God is exalted because of who he is in your life. David is not in no way here kind of gathered with a group of people and talking about God to them and he's, and he's pointing to God and he's saying his mercy and his truth and he's pointing up and down. No, David is saying, this is where my heart is. Oh God. Oh God, the word for God. He doesn't use the typical Hebrew word El for God. He uses the Hebrew word Elohim. The all supreme God. My heart is steadfast. His heart is steadfast and he's saying, and the purpose of a steadfast heart that is fixed upon the Lord is so that God can be exalted above the heavens and your glory above the earth. David's desire was that above all in his life that God would be exalted. There's an awesome thing when all we have a desire for is for people to know the Lord shared a little bit about that this morning in our study in Hosea, that, you know, God will use us in people's lives to bring people to Christ. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be an evangelist. And as I said, you don't have to be the next Billy Graham or Greg Laurie or, or, or pastor like in this church, myself or anybody else. No, God takes us as sons and daughters. He puts his spirit in us. He, he directs us. He leads us so that we can be a blessing to other people's lives. 
And we can enrich their lives, not with our knowledge and our wisdom, but that we can enrich their lives with who God is, that he is faithful and that he is the one who gives us victory in all of our battles. David says, be exalted, O God, above the heavens and your glory above all the earth. David had his own glory, but it seems that the glory that David was talking about in verse 1 was a result of what God had already given him. David's ability to play the lute. David's ability to be a great musician. David was not only a musician, he was not only a king. He was not only a preacher of God. He was not only a shepherd. He was not only a warrior. David, in a sense, was also a worship leader. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens and your glory above all the earth. And the whole purpose is for all to see and to know. What is that one thing that you want all to see and know about God in your life? What is that one thing that you tonight would say, this is what I want people to know about God? Some would most commonly say, I just want them to know that God is real. I just want them to know that God is faithful. I just want them to know that God can, can help them. I mean, sometimes that's what we say about our loved ones, right? When we see them, we're just like, man, if they only knew how much God loved them. If they just knew, you, you know, if that is the very thing that you desire for others to know, then live it out in front of them. Live it out. Some people think that living it out in front of them is, is following them around and going and doing what they're doing so that they could see the Christian side of things. No, I'm talking about persevering in your walk with the Lord, remaining faithful, being consistent is key. What, what people need in their life is consistency. They need consistency in their life. You need to be consistent so that others can be blessed by your consistency in your relationship with the Lord. It's for all to see, for all to know. And then look at verse 6. David changes in verse 6. He says that your beloved may be delivered. We wouldn't know in verses 1 through 5 that David had a need in his life. But here we see in verse 6 that David has a need. His request comes after his praise of God. Notice that. And I think that's the proper way to pray. Your request should always come after praise and worship to the Lord. Your prayer should always be God's goodness, his faithfulness, his, who he is. It's like the model prayer that Jesus says when the disciples say, Lord, teach us how to pray. And Jesus says, well, in this manner, this is how you should pray. Our Father who art in heaven, you're praying to God the Father who is in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. That your name would be revered. That your name would be worshipped and glorified. That you, God, would be magnified. Know that you're praying to a holy, righteous God who is not only your Father in heaven, but who is God, the creator of heaven and earth. A holy God. And I think it's interesting here because we see that this is kind of the manner in which David is praying. He exalts the Lord. He, he lifts his name. He praises God and he speaks these great, wonderful things. And remember, his praise was no secret. His praise for the Lord God was because of his mercy and his truth. And then after David takes this time to worship the Lord, then David gives a request. If you were just to read verses 1 through 5, and this would be the psalm, and that would be it, you would not know in any way that David had a need in his life until verse 6. It's interesting when we have needs in our life. Isn't that the first thing we bring out? You ask somebody how they're doing, and right away it's like, oh, you, you just don't know. You know it's, it's like, well, you know... I, I know your life's not perfect, but, you know, I ain't trying to hear all your business. You know what I mean? It's just, but, but it's always that. It's like, so how you doing, you know? And then, and then it's weird because then, you know, they'll give you the whole, the whole cha-cha, the 411, man. And it's half the time. It's like, you told me this like two years ago. It's the same thing. You're still doing the same thing. It's like, you know, but then there's these other ones where they're just like, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good. And it's like, how you doing? Great. The glory of the Lord has shown upon us today. And, and, you know, in your mind, you're like, that's a lie. They're all jacked up, man. 
You know what I mean? But the truth of the matter, you, go, you guys, listen, we're laughing because we do this. This is our family, right? This is how we are in church. This is how we, I'm, I'm not talking about people outside the church. You want to experience that? Talk to one another from time to time. See what happens. No, listen, in a sense, you wouldn't know David had a need in his life in the first five verses. All he talked about was God's goodness, God's faithfulness. And I see that sometimes with people that they'll say, they'll say, you know what, I'm good. I'm good because God's faithful. But boy, I'm going through it, man. My heart is broken. Or I'm discouraged. They're, they're not saying that they're giving up. They're not saying that they're bowing out. They're not saying that it's over. They're just saying, I know God is good. I know that he's faithful, but right now, I feel like I'm losing this battle. I know God's going to give me the victory, but right now, this is real. And that reality should never take you and put you on the bench. Biggest mistake we make. It's not what David's doing here. David is not on the sidelines. He's not on the bench. David's not taking a break. David is not doing any of that. David is saying, Lord, because of my heart that is steadfast and it's fixed on you. David has a need. Do you have a need tonight? Yes, you do. Well, David had a need, and guess what he said? Even in the midst of my need, my heart is fixed upon you. It's about you, God, not about me. We'll get to my need in a moment. What's more important is you. Do you guys don't see the prayer of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane here? You probably don't. I doubt you do. Jesus said, if there be any other way, let this cup pass me by. That was a real prayer. Did you know that? That was not some cool little statement to fill out the rest of the chapter so they had a couple of more verses. No, that was a real prayer. Christ in his humanity said, his request was, if there be any other way. I don't care how you interpret that. I don't care what translation, what language you read, whatever the case might be, chop it up however you want. Jesus prayed and said, if there be any other way, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. That, that's an amazing thing. In other words, Jesus was saying, Father, I have a need. But your will is primary. Mine is secondary. Your will is is number one, mine is number two. That's kind of the idea here with David's prayer. It, we all have needs. Man, if I were to say, let's pray right now for needs in our life, and we just started one by one from one end of this room, to the, we'd be here all night. But when you take the time to exalt the Lord first, when you take the time to bring glory to God's name, when you take the time to put Jesus in the proper place, which is the throne of your heart, and that your heart is fixed and steadfast on the Lord, after the praise and exaltation of the Lord God, then comes your petition or your need. David says that your beloved may be delivered. David's need was a need of deliverance. And this perhaps is a psalm that would encourage those that are going through something saying, listen, before you begin to dwell on your need and before you begin to be consumed by it and your worries and your anxieties and it takes up most of the thought process of your day, worship the Lord. Worship the Lord that your beloved may be delivered. The word beloved or beloved means loved one or loved ones knowing that the Lord loved him. David appealed on that basis. Knowing that the Lord loved him. When was the last time you prayed and said, Lord, you're beloved, talking about yourself? When was the last time you prayed that way? Think about that. I, I rarely, rarely, I think I've heard one person pray that in my entire Christianity. One person pray the same way that David said and says, you're beloved. And I will never forget when I heard this man pray, he had been in the ministry over 50 years. And he told me, he says, the reason why I say that, he says, is because I know how much God loves me. I know how much God loves me. And this is why David is saying that, because he knows how much the Lord loves him. So David appeals with this love that he's feeling 
from the Lord. And, and David's need, his request comes after his praise to God. And so kind of take that order down for you when you're praying. We often say in times of prayer, you know, exalt the name of the Lord before you exalt your need before the throne of the Lord. That your beloved may be delivered. Save with your right hand and hear me. The word right hand or save with your right hand has the idea of with your power. Exodus chapter 15 verse 6. And also Psalm chapter 20. Verse 6 and Psalm 45 in verse 4. The Lord's ability, his power to save. And I love what David says. He says, and hear me. The word here is anach in the Hebrew, which means to answer me. That's all it means, to answer me. That's all he's saying is, Lord, answer me. And then look at verse 7. This is amazing. Guys, when, 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 you, when, you, when you pray according to how the scriptures say to pray, Jesus says, if you ask anything of the Father in my name, he'll give it to you, right? And we also see that in the scriptures, the Bible says that we can ask anything according to his will and it shall be done. And notice that this is what David is doing. David asked according to the will of God. David asked according to the heart of the Lord. Because look at verse 7. This is what's amazing. God has spoken in his holiness. Do you see what's happening here in verse 7? In other words, when it says God has spoken in his holiness, this is what we would call a thus saith the Lord moment. David goes from being the psalmist of Israel. He goes from being a shepherd. He goes from being a musician skillfully playing before the Lord. He goes from being a worship leader. He goes from being a king. All of these things that I just shared with you that David was now transitions to another facet of David's life and David now has his thus saith the Lord moment that's what verse 7 says God has spoken in his holiness David now will prophesy as the Bible says in the book of Acts chapter 2 and verse 30 that David was also a prophet of the Lord it's pretty amazing how David is able to exercise these abilities and these gifts and his life be dispensed in all the gifts that God has given him because David's heart is fixed upon the Lord. It's interesting how people say, I just want to be used by God. Do you really want to be used by God? Because it requires a couple of things. One of them, total surrender. Not half of your heart, not part of your heart, but all your heart. That's the number one thing. It'll never happen if your heart is not fully given to the Lord. The second thing, you need to be willing to do anything for the Lord. I mean, we talked about like Hosea when we got into the book of Hosea. I mean, think about it. Hosea was being used by God. He says, go and marry this woman. She's going she's gonna to be a prostitute, man. She's going to go out on you. She's going to sleep with other men. And you're going to go and you're going to take her back. You're also going to go and you're going to pay the price of a whore to get your wife back. And you're going to love her. That was his ministry. You got other prophets. The Lord says, walk among the people naked. Other prophets, lay on your side for an entire year. Other prophets, wear dirty underwear in front of the people. The, the ministry of the prophets were never easy. They were difficult. Not just because the task that God called them to, but majority of their ministry was, was and were illustrated sermons to the people and their sin. It was so that the people were not just saying the word of God, but they were living God's word. That's what the prophets were. They were examples, living examples, not of only of God's word, but then their message was never popular because the prophets, you know, it was always a message of turn or burn kind of message that God is going to judge. And you see that their ministries and their lives being used by the Lord wasn't always easy. So the question is, do you want to be used by God? Well, yes. Are you willing to do whatever God asks you to do? Yes. David here was a man that went from just being the psalmist to now the prophet. God has spoken in his holiness. I will rejoice. I will divide 
Shechem. Remember Shechem, we talked about it this morning, a very important place. It says that the priest there in Hosea chapter 6, it says that the priest went murdering by the way of Shechem. And it's interesting because Shechem was a very important place in the life of Abraham, in the life of Jacob, and in the life of Joshua. It was a place where the people came to the altar of the Lord, and it was the central, it was the regional part of Israel. It's what kept the whole people of Israel intact. And notice what he says, I will divide the very thing that keeps them intact. He was talking about the regional part of Israel, all of it as a whole. And measure out the valley of Sokoth. Gilead is mine. Manasseh is mine. This is those that are on the east side of the Jordan. Ephraim also is the helmet for my head. This is the northern kingdom, Ephraim. And, and, and remember that Ephraim was, was large in size. And, and it was the more prominent and dominant tribe. This was the son of Joseph, a son that he had in, in, in Egypt as the second in command to the Pharaoh Ephraim and Manasseh. But Ephraim became a reference to Israel, Israel being the northern kingdom, at least after the kingdoms were divided. And Ephraim was called Ephraim, or Israel called Ephraim because of its size. And, and Ephraim would encompass all of the tribes, the ten tribes that stayed on the north. But notice what he says, also is the helmet for my head. In other words, it's not saying, God's not saying that he wore Ephraim as a helmet. What he's saying is that he was the head as the leader. This is why Ephraim's name is used a lot. And it says that both Ephraim and Judah were all under the Lord's domain. Judah means rule. It means lawgiver. He says, Judah is my lawgiver. So you have the northern kingdom and you have its strength and its size, but you also have Judah, the southern kingdom and its rule. So the people as a whole, I will divide Shechem, regional Israel, north and south included, the strength and the rule, all of it was under the Lord's dominion. And it would seem that perhaps this was a need in David's life when he needed to lead the people in a way that would bring about great victory in his life. He goes on to say in verse 9, Moab is my washpot. The idea of washpot would, would, would have the understanding of uh, the days in which they would, they would wash their feet. This is where the waste would go. And some would look at this term and say that this was a derogatory term towards Moab. And it could very well be. But I also believe that it also would imply that the people of Moab would be given to a life of service to God's people. The Moabites were God's enemies. So God wasn't just God over Israel. God was God over all the nations of the earth. Moab was my washpot. Over Edom, I will cast my shoe. Notice that. The people of Edom, as we see the Edomites, remember that um, we had Herod who was in the temple of the Lord in charge of the worship of the Lord during the time of Christ and he was an Edomene. He's from the descendants from the people of the Edomites. These are descendants of Esau. And the idea here is I will cast my shoe. Well, shoes are a very dirty thing, especially in the Middle East. They, you know, the ground is dirty, it's dusty, it's dirty. And you guys know that if, you know, like in the book of Ruth, they have to, you know, take the shoe off, you know. And, 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 and that whole picture is a Middle Eastern uh, reference. And, and the shoe is a very dirty thing. So to have a shoe thrown at you or to have a shoe, you know, you're slapped with the shoe, that was, that was a, a detestable thing. I remember watching a video of our president getting a sh shoe thrown at him during one of his speeches. He was in the Middle East, and he dodged it really well. But, you know, most people that would look at that say, oh, man, they try, to, they try to hit him with a shoe. You know, they couldn't take any other type of weapon. No, that was worse than a weapon. They, were, they, were, they, were, they still practice that today. And the throwing of the shoe was was saying, you're detestable to us. You're, you're like the very scum that we walk upon. And they weren't only saying that to our president, they were saying that to the nation that he presided over as president. This is what we have to say to you and your people. This is what they are. 
the Lord was victorious over Edom, over Philistia, which is known as the people of the Philistines. He says, I will triumph. Now, this is interesting because David could say this knowingly. Why? Because the Bible is very clear in 1 Samuel in chapter, excuse me, 2 Samuel chapter 8. Jot it down, 2 Samuel chapter 8. We see the Lord had given David over the Philistines in verse 1. The Lord had given David favor over the Moabites in verse 2. And the Lord had given David favor over the Edomites in verse 14. All of these in chapter 8. In verse 1, in verse 2, and in verse 14. The Lord had given David victory over his enemies. Now you see what David is doing here. David praises the Lord, worships the Lord, exalts the name of the Lord, then says, I have a need, I need to be delivered, Lord. Save with your right hand and hear me. David knows what it is to be protected by the Lord. David knows what it is to receive victory from the Lord. And then David begins to give a list of those that God had already given him victory over. So this psalm really is a psalm in which that speaks of God's past victories in the life of his present servants that are serving him presently now, and they might be going through a difficult place, and, and here David is saying, Lord, deliver and save. And then as we close tonight, he goes on to say this very thing. Who will bring me into the strong city? It's a question. Who will lead me to Edom? Is it not you, O God, who cast us off? David, realizing that apart from the Lord... All battles are lost. And you, O oh God, who did not go out with our armies. David had seen when the Lord was not with Israel at times, and he's seen the devastation that could happen. And he says, give us help from trouble, for the help of man is useless. I love that verse. For the help of man is useless. Through God, we will do valiantly, for it is he who shall tread down our enemies. For man's help is useless, but through God we will do valiantly. David encourages himself at the end of this psalm, and he's saying, listen, I know what it is to trust in my own wisdom. I know what it is to trust in my own strength. You can get far, but not very far. Your wheels will be spinning. You'll be moving, but the idea would be that you're getting nowhere fast. And he's saying, listen, man's help is useless, but through God we will do valiantly. The Lord will give us the victory. So whatever the circumstance, whatever the need is, when we praise and we worship the Lord, then what do we do? We say, okay, Lord, here's my need. And then just leave it there. And then look back and say, Lord, I know you're going to get me through this because you've gotten me through this or that or whatever the case might be. Or you did it for David or you did it for Israel. I know you'll do it for me.